and to him be all the glory. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Becky. As we begin today, we read from Psalm chapter 93, the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns, he is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed, he has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established, it shall never be moved. Your throne is established from all old, your, from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees, your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forever. We worship a God this morning as we stand together. The Lord reigns this morning. He is the conquering lion of Judah, the sacrificial lamb who died for our sins. And we worship him today, the lion and the lamb.
glory to him today. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole world is full of his glory. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let them say among all the nations, the Lord reigns.
great singing. Please be seated. Thank you.
family. My name is Micah Frink, and uh, I serve on staff here at Brainerd in our communications department. I want to welcome you uh, to Brainerd, especially if it's your first time with us. And so just have a few announcements for us this morning. And parents in the room, these are specifically for you guys this morning. So number one, parent-child commissioning. Man, this is such a special time for us as a church to affirm and partner with uh, parents in the room. And, and so if you're a parent, have a new born or a child who hasn't been commissioned yet, I want to encourage you to go to BrainerdBaptist.org slash events and register. This will be May 7th and 8th. It'll be a brunch on the 7th and then a commissioning at each of our venues on the 8th. And so if you want to be a part of that, make sure to uh, go and register. Number two, of course, VBS. This is a huge event for Brainerd all over uh, Tennessee as well and throughout the United States for the Southern Baptist Convention. And this is not just for the children in the room, but it's also to reach our community. And so we want to encourage you, if you'd like to volunteer for VBS, you can go to, you guessed it, BrainerdBaptist.org slash events to register to be a part of it. We would love to have you volunteer at either this campus or the North Georgia, North Georgia campus as well. And if you have a child who you'd like to participate as well, you can go to the same link and participate. Uh, May 1st is the deadline for those who want to volunteer for VBS to register. And it's also the deadline for your child. if They're going to participate to get a t-shirt. So I encourage you to register. Lastly, we want to put something on your radar. Kids Camp coming up this summer, June 27th through July 1st. It'll be at Camp to Know Him in Pisgah, Alabama. And our kids ministry are excited to welcome kids who are currently in third, fourth, and fifth grade. So if you're a parent or grandparent for a kid who's in third, fourth, or fifth grade, uh, go to, um, what's the link? BrainerdBaptist.org slash events to register. Um, I want to put that on your radar uh, for this summer. It's going to be a ton of fun. They're looking at the red letters of Jesus, right? So in God's word where we see red letters, it's Christ speaking to us. So what's Christ's message to our kids? And so it's going to be an awesome time. Um, so make sure to register for that. And so now as we transition to a time of prayer, I want to encourage you, if you came prepared to give this morning, tithes and offerings, look for a blue box in the back in the lobby as you exit, or you can also give online. So Pray with me. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the cross, the power of the cross. That's the reason why we can be here and celebrate together. We can celebrate the gospel, its impact on us. We can gather as a fellowship of believers with joy. And God, we do pray uh, for the tithes and offerings that uh, our congregation has um, come prepared to give or giving online. Lord, that you bless those offerings, that they would go toward the furtherance of your gospel and the mission here at Brainerd Baptist Church. Lord, we pray for the rest of our time this morning. Pray for our missions moment coming up, Lord, as we direct our minds and our hearts to thinking about what you're doing in countries across the world and, and even right here in Chattanooga. Would we always be a mission-focused, missions-oriented in our hearts for you and, and a part of the Great Commission. God, we pray for the rest of this service. Bless the time together. Bless Dr. Shaddix as he brings the word. And I pray this all in your name. Amen. Eastern European Connection was uh, a ministry that, that God um, allowed us to start in Las Vegas back in 2009. Mission statement is to connect Eastern Europeans to Jesus Christ and to each other. And so it was a platform to share the gospel with Eastern Europeans, to disciple them and to plant churches. Three years ago, I was in a city in the east uh, of Romania, which is fairly close to Ukraine, and we were working with a people group, the Our Romanian People Group. And it just so happened that at that church that we're partnering with, there was a mission team also from Odessa, Ukraine, that was there. And so we uh, found out about this church, a Pastor Mihai, who's a friend of mine, as soon as the war started, he had a burden to reach out to the refugees to help them, to share Christ with them. And so what uh, Mihai has been doing is going to the border and, and people that need a place to stay, they need food and shelter. He takes them back to either his house or the church. They provide food, shelter. And so it's, it's a, more of an immediate needs ministry, but 
a great way just to demonstrate the love of Christ to these, these families that have been through so much. And so uh, there's a great need for supplies and food. And also we plan to take some, uh, some Bibles over and some evangelistic materials uh, in, in Russian and hopefully Ukrainian as well as a way to meet the spiritual needs. And, and so and I'm sure as well they need volunteers to go and serve. It's just uh, one of those times, I believe, like Esther 414, that for such a time as this, that not just me, but whoever at Brainerd or other ministries and churches, that uh, the need is now to go and help and serve uh, the Ukrainian people. faith family and guests it's great to see you let's continue to worship the Lord now through the study of his word uh, my uh, lips and tongue and vocal cords are tempted to tell you to turn to Mark's gospel because I'm in the habit of doing that but uh, we put a period on that uh, that study last uh, Lord's Day I want you to turn to first Peter Peter wrote a couple of letters in the New Testament Way over toward the back of your Bible, you can find Revelation and then back up a, a book or so and, and uh, you'll, you should find First and Second Peter. If you don't know where that is, uh, look in the table of contents in your Bible. If you're in the room, there's some uh, copies in the racks in front of you. If you don't have a Bible with you, if you're joining us online, I hope you uh, are able to find a Bible and find First Peter. Uh, we want to see what God would say to us through this letter. Uh, while you're getting all that together, let me also say uh, at the end of the message, the Lord willing, we're uh, going to share the Lord's Supper together. So if you came in today and you didn't grab those elements uh, that uh, were handed out and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I certainly encourage you to maybe get up and go and get one of those and uh, be ready uh, for that. 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter is the human author, but he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and that makes this God's word for us. Here's what the Bible says. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for the obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. And I want you to turn over a couple of pages to the last chapter of the book, 1 Peter chapter 5. And I want to read the, the closing of this letter. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12. By Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I've written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Probably all of us have heard the ancient proverbs, not a biblical proverb, but uh, ancient saying, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. But if you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. The idea, of course, is that, you know, if you provide somebody with, uh, you know, a, 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 something that meets an immediate physical need, you're going to be able to meet that need in the moment, uh, in the situation. But if you teach somebody how to fish, you're going to do something for them that is going to enable them to really approach every day uh, of their lives uh, with the help uh, that they need. I think uh, that realization is something that is desperately needed in the contemporary church. I fear that many 
parishioners, uh, church members, uh, listeners of sermons uh, come to church looking for the preacher to give them a fish. So we come expecting uh, the sermon to be something that addresses a, an immediate, particular, specific situation in our lives. We want somebody to give us a fish that will feed us for that day. It will get us through the day. It will address our current situation. It will, it will help us in that particular season of, of life. Many pastors and preachers have been glad to accommodate that desire and have consequently relegated their preaching to doing just that, answering the questions that people are asking in the immediate, providing uh, 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 practical help that addresses some real life uh, situation, reducing the Bible to a collection of pragmatic principles and ideas and steps and application. What that has done, uh, among other things, is it has created a generation of Christians who have had their pragmatism heightened and their appetites wet and their expectations turn toward that being what God has to say to us, is giving us a fish so that we can make the day. Truth of the matter is, sometimes um, the truth of God's word is not so much that which is intended to give us a fish in order to feed us a particular meal, but is intended to be that which teaches us to fish and actually prepares us for a lifetime of walking with God and living out his mission in this world. I think that's the way Peter starts this letter. Even here in this greeting that he gives uh, and this address to the people that he's writing to, he jumps into the deep end of the theological pool, some have said, and doesn't begin with some assurance and promise of some pragmatic answer to immediate situation, but puts on the table something, something that will be absolutely essential. It will be absolutely crucial for those people in a very practical way every day of their lives, especially with regard to the situation they were in at that particular point and what was on the horizon. Now let me make that connection for you and tell you how excited I am about coming to this place due to its relevance for our day and time. Peter's writing to a group of people that were facing some persecution against their faith, but it was nothing it was nothing like they were about to face. Best understanding we have is that this letter was written sometime in the years leading up to 64 AD, but not at that particular point yesterday, uh, yeah, at, at this particular time. Uh, and some of you know this from history in 64 AD is when Rome burned under Nero. He fiddled while he watched his city go up in flames, and then he blamed it on the Christians. And it was at that point, it was at that point that the intense persecution of believers started, but it had already begun from the standpoint of bias against believers, prejudice against believers, unfairness against believers, pushback against some of the, 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 the practices, uh, not the least of which was the Lord's Supper as they were uh, being accused of cannibalism and things like that as, 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 as believers' convictions and practices were perverted, they were misunderstood. Uh, and they were accused of things. All of that stuff was already going on, but the intense persecution hadn't yet started. Now, you may connect that with some things that we've talked about before because I've told you that I, I think that's where we are in the United States of America today. Now, intense persecution and physical persecution against believers and even martyrdom has been taking place among our brothers and sisters in Christ in different parts of the world for, uh, for, for years. 
Uh, But by and large, we've been insulated from that in this country. Not only that, we have been part of a country that historically has celebrated our faith uh, and and applauded it, and uh, many have embraced it. But you know that those days are in the past. We live in a day-to-day that many of us would have looked at several years ago and and, and said that will never happen here, but it has happened here. A complete upheaval, a, a turning around. It didn't happen overnight, but we've seen it, listen, in an escalating, accelerating fashion here as Christian values have not only become not the norm anymore, but they become that which have been the brunt and are the brunt of a lot of criticism, a lot of pushback, a lot of hatred, a lot of name-calling and slander, and some of you have been on the receiving end of that. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And it's going to get nothing but worse. And it's not going to be limited. Listen to me, who's in the White House? What political party? Some of you are putting your eggs in the basket in the wrong place. And I'm not talking about choosing political party. I'm talking about in what what, what you're trusting in to curb that, to change that. The Bible has been very clear very clear to tell us that until Jesus comes, this is going to become worse and worse and worse. And and, and that means that where we are right now, I think, I think has a strong relationship with where the people that Peter was talking to are. There is persecution, there is pushback, we see it, we sense it, it is largely against our morals, against our convictions, against our belief system, but let me tell you what always follows from that is then pushback and persecution against those who embrace those convictions and embrace those beliefs. Get ready for it, church. Get ready for it because it's coming. So when we read 1 Peter, we read a letter that I think is very, very relevant for our lives today. We're in the midst of that pushback and that animosity and that bias and that prejudice against the Christian faith, but it's going to get worse. Probably should our Lord tarry to the point of physical persecution a physical pushback. So we need to come to 1 Peter. We need to come to 1 Peter with an attentiveness and a receptivity of something that certainly is no mere historical study. It is something in which our Lord desires to speak into our lives. And so that leads us to this place right here. This is where uh, what I want us to see in these first few verses right here is that believers in Jesus Christ can be confident. We can be confident that he is in sovereign control over both our salvation and our suffering. Let me say it again. Believers in Jesus Christ can be confident and if we said it another way that I'll show you in just a minute, can stand firm, can remain immovable, can stand firm with the conviction that he is in sovereign control over both our salvation and our suffering. And I would submit to you today that, beloved, is something that needs to be part of our fishing, not grasping for a hot meal for a particular circumstance just in our day and time, our family situation, our circumstance today, but something that is going to be the key, listen, is going to be the key in us standing strong, being firm as this persecution escalates, as it accelerates. So let's take a look at this in this introduction as well as the conclusion to the letter. I want to introduce you uh, very simply this morning to the author, to the recipients, and to the greeting. That's what we're going to find in verses 1 and 2. But I want to call your attention to some characteristic of each one of those. For example, when we talk about the author, I want to show you, I want to show you the pastor the pastor sent by Jesus. When we talk about the recipients, I want you to see the people selected in Jesus. And when we look at this greeting, 
I want us to think about the provision sought from Jesus. So there is truth, there is lessons, there is something that, 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 that uh, uh, is added to our ability to stand strong in the midst of persecution. Let's start with the author. And I want to show you the pastor sent by Jesus. We're told that Peter... The apostle, one of the 12, of course, is the author of this letter. The word apostle means one sent, a messenger, and we're told here he's an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter begins his letter by simply positioning himself as he was as one of the 12 that was called by Jesus and then sent out by uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter puts on the table from the very outset, not in, in calling attention to this as part of his, his identity, the authority that he comes with and brings this message to the people of the Lord. If you'll just hold your place here and flip back over to chapter 5, there are some things that we learn, however, I think even from the, uh, the end of this letter that we will see going through it that help us to understand the perspective from which Peter is coming. In chapter 5, verse 12, Peter says, by Silvanus or Silas, this would have been the companion, missionary companion of the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. Now he's a partner with Peter, a faithful brother as I regard him, uh, he says. He's also going to mention uh, people that he represents uh, in the city of Rome. In verse 13, she, likely referring to the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the church, who is at Babylon. He doesn't call it Rome. He uses this term that particularly his uh, Jewish background believers would have understood uh, to be that place that is characterized by great arrogance and pride as well as great power uh, and might. Possibly he's referring to Rome in this term here just to keep this under the radar a little bit more at this particular time. But he says that they send you greetings Greetings, and so does Mark, my son. And so we know who he's with, where he is, uh, why he is, 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 is saying what he's saying. But notice what, what, what he says here. In verse 12, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. So everything I've said to you in this letter, so the way he's going to close, I've exhorted you, I've declared to you God's grace for you in your circumstances, in your journey. And then look at the end of verse 12. Stand firm in it, he says. Stand firm in it. Why would I refer to the Apostle Peter here as the pastor whom Jesus sent or the one sent by Jesus? Not because Peter was, was, was fulfilling the official pastoral office like Ephesians chapter 4, 11 and 12 talk about. He was an apostle. He identifies himself that way in verse 1 here in 1 Peter chapter 1. But as you go through this letter and even here at the conclusion, what you are going to do is hear the heart of an individual that loves these people, that cares about them, and is attempting to shepherd them along in this journey. So I want to introduce you to the author of this letter, who certainly was an apostle, but also is writing here with a pastor's heart to people that he loves dearly and ultimately would sacrifice uh, himself for in his, uh, in his ministry. A guy that is pleading with them. He's encouraging them. He's exhorting them. There are several themes we're going to run across that surface in this letter that I think fit this demeanor, this attitude, this mood, this heartbeat that Peter brings. One of them is hope. We'll see hope all the way through this. He's giving them hope in the midst of what what can seem like a hopeless situation. I want you to remember that. You find yourself... In situations where you're being persecuted, you are suffering for the sake of the gospel, the pushback is coming. 
We're going to see themes of hope running all the way through this. Not only that, I've already mentioned exhortation. You're going to hear the pleading of an individual, the command of an apostle from an authoritative sense, but a plea to people to get this. When you read 1 Peter and you'll notice it, it's almost like it's one exhortation after another. He's going from one imperative command, imperative plea after another. He does this with a pastor's heart. Another thing that we'll see is consolation. He's consoling them. He's, he's, he's putting, putting balm on their, 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 their wounds, their hurts. He's comforting them. We see the shepherd's heart. We've already mentioned suffering the whole ha- last part of the book and the majority of it is going to be dominated by this theme. But listen, Peter's not just warning people about suffering. He's exhorting them to suffer well. There's a difference in those two things. It's possible to suffer but not suffer very well, which is most of our inclination, isn't it? Peter, from a pastoral standpoint, is giving these people directions on how to act in the midst of the suffering. There's a lot of pragmatic stuff here, a lot of practical stuff in this letter. He's doing it. He's giving it to them, exhorting these people to suffer well as this persecution comes. And then the idea of submission is another thing we'll find in Peter's lesson here. And this is part, I think, of responding well, acting well, doing good in the midst of this persecution. The idea of Christians giving up what they might think is their rights, what the world is telling them is their rights, but doing it as a testimony to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So look for those themes as we walk through this letter, as we hear this author's heart under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you're going to hear the heart of someone who cares deeply about his brothers and sisters in Christ, and he's speaking to them very pastorally. So the author is the pastor sent by Jesus. Now let's talk about the recipients. And this is where we really get into the theology and the doctrine of of what Peter is saying as he introduces this letter and as he addresses these believers. Look in the middle of verse 1. He's writing, notice, to those who are elect. Okay? There, I've said it. I've got it on the table. We got to talk about it, don't we? Peter is writing to a group of people that he categorizes not in an unfamiliar way, but a very familiar way with regard to the Christian economy. The word elect is a description that is used uh, the third most number of times to refer to believers in the New Testament, second only to disciples and saints. So the saints and disciples, and then here right at the top of the list, you've got this word elect. And it's right here that we come to a place in Scripture that that really is uncomfortable for most of us. In fact, that uncomfortableness has led us to the point of breaking friendships over it, firing pastors over it, leaving ministries over it, splitting churches over it. There is something about this doctrine that goes against the grain of what is comfortable with us. And that for, to us, and that is this idea that, that, that the Lord elects those that he calls to himself. Now, this word, like another word we'll talk about in a moment in verse 2, the word foreknowledge is a word that we've done a lot of things with. We want to make them things that will fit into our, uh, you know, our perception, our comfort zone, our comfort level. And so one of the things we have a tendency do, to do is redefine them, redefine them in the way that, uh, that would fit what makes us comfortable. But we can't redefine this word. It is what it is. It means what it means. It is the idea that God elects some. He chooses some. He selects some to be in in relationship to him in, in two ways. Number one, a special relationship with him. The second way is a special responsibility. 
So a special relationship with him and a special responsibility on behalf of him characterizes those that he chooses. Now, beloved, we say we're a people of the book. We say we believe the Bible. We say it's the word of God. It is inerrant. It is infallible. It is supernatural. But there isn't any other subject in, 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 uh, in the scriptures that causes more people who would make those confessions to then take God's word and either ignore it or redefine it. We can't ignore the doctrine of election in scripture. And that is that God elects some to this special relationship. Now listen to me. Come in here real close. I'm going to show you. I want to show you in just a moment why Peter chooses this subject to address people in this situation. Let's don't forget to read it in its context. But we can't read the New Testament without understanding that there is nothing that we bring to the table when it comes to this saving relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said to his disciples in John's gospel, I chose you, you did not choose me. That, that is what it is, okay? He, he meant what he said. And over and over again, this word is used to refer to those that God has done this, has selected, has chosen to come into this special relationship with him and, 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 and have this special responsibility in, in relationship with him. And this is incredibly important. Now, let me just stop right there and answer the question, well, do, do, do I believe that, that man exercises will in coming to Christ? I do. I, I, I do believe that. And you say, well, wait a second. You know, how, how can you believe, how, how can you say, how can you say that, that God chooses some and he doesn't choose others and there's nothing we bring to the table, but then turn around and, and, and invite people to say yes to Christ? to choose to come, to exercise their will, to become Christians and place their faith in him. You may ask the question of me or anyone else who would say that, that was asked of Charles Spurgeon when some ask him, how does he reconcile the sovereignty of God and the free will of man? And his response was, I don't. I never try to reconcile friends. And he says the sovereignty of God and the free will of man are friends in Scripture. You say, I can't get my, arm, my, my mind around that. I can't either. But you know what? That, that's why God is God and you're not. That's why God is God and I'm not. Because there are things that can be reconciled in his mind that our minds don't have the ability to reconcile. Spurgeon is said to go on and describe it in another way, and he said as, as if you take a doorway and you just picture one of these doorways into this, you know, into this room, and he says when you're standing on this side of it, over the top of it, 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 it says whosoever will may come, and that's the realm we live in. That's where we live, and we see that, and we know that. The gospel is preached, and people are invited to come to know Christ, and the invitation in Scripture is whosoever will may come. But Spurgeon says you get on the other side of the door in eternity and you turn around and oh, written over the door on that side is chosen before the foundation of the world. And you know what the author is doing right here? You know what Peter's doing? He's putting this in context and he's telling Christians, listen to me, your ability to stand firm in the midst of persecution is not going to be determined just by what you see on this side of the door, but it's going to be determined by your knowledge of what's on the other side, the reality and the truth. And this is why, brothers and sisters, when we come to the Word of God, whenever we come to the free will of man, we preach it, we study it, we embrace it. But equally as important, listen to me, when we come to where the election of God, the elective purposes of God are taught, we embrace it, we receive it, and we ask the question, why is that what's being taught in this particular context? And let me just tell you, let me just tell you, when, when your world's falling apart around you, because of persecution and suffering, 
and things are chaotic and you're in the midst of stuff you didn't sign up for, the last thing you want to depend on is your ability to stand strong. You want to know why Paul's, why Peter's talking about election right here? You want to know why he starts off in his address? He's putting on the table the only thing that will enable believers to survive and thrive and stand firm as the heat is turned up and things go, grow worse and worse. I, I don't know about you. I hope I do you in this sense. I hope you, you, you would think like I do at that point in that the last thing I want to trust in is my ability. The last thing I want to trust in when the heat is turned up, when chaos is going on, is is, is the inclination that, hey, I signed up for this, and therefore it's going to be me who gets me through this. It's not going to cut it. But in the midst of the heat and the persecution, if I can remember, if I can embrace the reality that I didn't sign up for this, God signed me up for this. And if God signed me up for this, then this hasn't caught him off guard and he will be able to sustain me in the midst of it. Can can you embrace a theology? Can you embrace a theology that is made up of something that you may not be able to reconcile in your mind? You may not be able to figure it all out. How is it that God chooses some and doesn't choose others? And then how is that we choose to embrace Christ? I don't know. I don't know, but what I know is both are in Scripture. Both are in Scripture, and it's important for you and I to embrace them both fully, fully, even that which we can't comprehend, but also to lean into every passage of Scripture and ask the question, why is that particular side of this being emphasized in this passage of Scripture? So Peter describes these recipients as people who are selected in Jesus. Now, let me show you how he unpacks that in three particular ways. Number one, he says we are chosen as sojourners. We're we're chosen as sojourners. Notice, to those who are elect exiles, he says. The word exiles is the word stranger. It refers to a person who is in a particular place, but, but, but they are there as someone who doesn't belong there and someone who is not basically putting down stakes there, investing in that. Now, Peter's talking to a group of people that that was characteristic of from a physical standpoint. These people he's going to refer to as those who are in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, we don't know how the gospel entirely, how the gospel got to all of those places. We know a little bit about some of those places. Others we really don't know anything about. But he's talking to people who actually are in those places. But do you know what he's saying to them? You're not citizens of those places. You're not from there. And down here in the south, we know what that means, right? I've I've been in places where if you didn't have the right last name, it doesn't matter how long you stayed there, you would never be from there, right? You know what that is about. Well, you know, Peter is saying to a group of people, this is true of you. You are strangers. And when we read our New Testament, we know that this is something that is characteristic of us as believers. Wherever we live, Wherever we're from, geographically, wherever our family is, it doesn't matter. We are still strangers everywhere we might go, everywhere we might live in this world. Why? Because the Bible says we're citizens of another land, right? Paul says our citizenship is in heaven. Now, most of us in the room have been the beneficiaries of being citizens of a country that we're thankful for and we've been greatly blessed to live in. And I think that reality compels us to certainly a loyalty and a patriotism. And I've told you how I felt about that before. I, I, I'm, I'm at the front of the line when it comes to that, just like, like many of you are. But we got to be careful, don't we? we got to be careful that, that our citizenship on the roles of a nation, a country in this life 
is never allowed to rise above in value and importance and influence in our life the fact that it doesn't matter what nation we are citizens of, we are still strangers. And this is what causes many of us as believers in Jesus Christ to end up elevating our citizenship as Americans above our citizenship as Christians. And we begin to put our confidence in the things of this world, whether it be a political party or particular ideology or just the American dream, right? And that is you, you have a vision, you have a dream, and you've got the opportunity to, to amass a fortune and, and, and put together a cushy retirement and, 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 and get what you've got coming to you and, and, and uh, you have your family and, and, and have all of the stuff that you want to have. We, 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 without realizing we embrace that as an ideology sometimes that rises above the, the, the teaching and the truth of what it means to be strangers and pilgrims and exiles in a place that is not our own. This is who Peter's writing to. He's writing to people that are just passing through. And don't ever forget that. That's you, believer in Christ. This is not permanent it's temporary. Be careful which basket you put your eggs in. Be careful where you put down stakes, what you put your eggs, what becomes your value system because we are chosen as sojourners is what Scripture tells us. Secondly, we're chosen to suffer. We're chosen to suffer. Notice he says to those who are elect exiles, strangers of the dispersion in these places. Now, this word dispersion or translate dispersion, my English translation, is a, is a word that we need to lean into. It, it's a word in the New Testament that is almost exclusively, if not exclusively, used in a technical sense to refer to Jews that were scattered abroad, Jewish people that were scattered abroad out of their homeland. Now, there is a disagreement about uh, the background nature of the believers that Peter's, uh, uh, Peter's writing to here. Uh, many believe he is writing to people because of these names that are mentioned and where they are that are and where he's writing from, writing from Rome at this particular time, that these are largely people that were saved, that came to Christ out of a Gentile background, a non-Jewish background. There are also others, and I would put myself in this camp, who believe that the largest majority of those believers were probably people that had been saved out of a Jewish background. And, and I think the use of this word right here is one thing that calls attention to that. This is that technical term that, that refers to uh, you know, Jews that were scattered abroad. But I, I don't think it's just that. There are other things like like the fact that there are more quotations proportionately in the book of 1 Peter to the Old Testament than any other book of the Bible, in proportion. Not in number, but in proportion. It's a small book, and the number of times Peter actually quotes or cites the Old Testament, references it, is really off the charts in comparison to other books. And it would seem to suggest that he's assuming that his readers had some understanding of those types of things. But let me show you something else. You can flip over to the book of Acts real quick if you're holding a Bible. Let me just show you a couple of things that, you know, in the book of Acts that I think might point to this as well. The fact that these uh, listeners were largely saved out of a Jewish background. Uh, in, in Acts chapter 8, and this would have some, been something that had already taken place by this time, uh, chapter 7 is where Stephen was stoned to death for uh, uh, preaching the gospel. And then verse 1 of chapter 8 in, in, in Acts says, And Saul, or Paul, approved of his execution. This is obviously before the Apostle Paul was the Apostle Paul. He was just a Pharisee, and he was persecuting Christians. And so he approved of Stephen's ex execution. Look at the rest of the verse. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered. Look at that. 
They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles, okay? So we know there were things that happened in the early decades of the church in which believers in Christ were pushed out. The largest number obviously would have been citizens of this area, the Jewish people. Turn over a couple of chapters to chapter 12. Now this is something historically we know happened in the years leading up to the Neronian persecution. So this would have taken place before that happened. Acts chapter 12 verse 1. About that time Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, who was practically the pastor of the church at Jerusalem. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And then look at verse 3. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Possibly one of the things that prompted Peter to now be in Rome when he writes this letter. My point is simply, is there had already some things taken place in Jerusalem that would have practically pushed many Jewish believers out of that land into other regions. Now, by and large, practically by way of application, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether these, these people he's writing to were from a Jewish background or from a Gentile background. They all had now come to know Christ and they're Christians. They have a new identity. And so when we make application, you know, we're, we're just reading, you know, God's speaking to us as believers. It may help us. Uh, we may wrestle with it with some of the passages or verses or things that are said as we walk through it. But by and large, it doesn't matter. But I do want you to see here in 1 Peter chapter 1 that Peter is writing to a people that he considers to be chosen to suffer in this dispersion. And so I want to ask you, did you know that about you? Did you know that about your faith? Did you know that this is what God elected you to? He elected you, he elected me to a journey of suffering in this life. Why? Because we're not from here. Why? Because we're not citizens of this world. We don't embrace its ideologies. We don't, we don't align ourselves with its practices. And that's always going to create pushback. And so there is this natural relationship between, listen to this, suffering and being a sojourner being persecuted and being a citizen of another country, another land. This is why the Apostle Paul would say to the Philippians in Philippians 1 verse 29, and to you it has been granted, listen to this, to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him but also to suffer for his sake. Part of me right now wants to know, wants to say, is that what you signed up for? But that's really not theologically accurate in this past. Did you know that's what God signed you up for? When he elected you, when he called you, when he chose you, he called you and elected you to be a traveler, a pilgrim, a stranger in this world. And along with that, it is naturally going to bring pushback and suffering. We are chosen as sojourners. We're chosen to suffer. And then finally here in this idea of him unpacking the recipients, we're chosen for salvation. We're chosen for salvation. Now Peter even unpacks this in three ways. I know I'm giving you multiple levels here, but it's important for us to understand the structure here. So in verse 2, he begins to talk about how God has elected us to salvation. And basically describes it three ways. And, and, and probably the simplest way to understand it is I think he talks about who has selected us, how he selected us, and why he selected us. Let me show them to you. Let's start with the who. Peter says that you are selected by God. Look at verse 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, just like the word elect or election, this is another one of those words in the New Testament that it kind of rubs against our grain. And by the way, when I say that, I hope you know, I'm talking about me too. I, I, I'm, I'm talking, it, it rubs against the grain of my understanding, of my feeling, and if I could just be honest, the way I would want it to be if I were king of the world, all right? 
This idea of election and selection, the uncomfortable nature that it gives. Well, well, just like election, this word foreknowledge is the same way. And so our immediate tendency is to redefine the word in a way that lines up with our comfort level. We do that with election. We do it with foreknowledge, okay? And so many have come to the word foreknowledge and they said, well, this obviously means foresight. God looked into the future a long time ago and he saw that I was going to accept Christ, so he elected me. He chose me. There's a couple of problems with that, not the least of which is the definition of the word. The word doesn't indicate that. It suggests a knowing by way of setting apart of relationship. And it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't speak primarily of a foresight. Now, I can prove this to you in this chapter because in chapter 1, Peter uses this word another time. Look at verse 19. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, with the precious blood of Christ, you've been saved. Like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Verse 20, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. All right, so let's just assume for a second that the word foreknowledge means to look into the future and see what's going to happen and then act accordingly. God looked into the future. He saw that I was going to accept Christ, and so he said, ah, Shaddock's going to accept Christ. I'll build my plan around that. Put that here in this verse. Jesus comes, lives a life we couldn't live, dies a death we should have died, dies for your sin and mine. If that's what this word means, then what happened is God looked into the future and eternity passed. He looked into the future and he said, oh, look, Jesus is going to sacrifice himself on the cross. I think I'll build my plan around that. And immediately we would look at that and say, that's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Why? Because that's not what God did. He foreknew Jesus from the foundation of the world by ordaining, sovereignly orchestrating this to be the case. This was his plan. Not foresight, but foreknowledge in the sense of setting apart for this purpose, for this particular relationship. Romans 8, 28, familiar passage of Scripture. Many of you know it. We talk about all things work together for the good of those that love God and are called according to his purpose. And sometimes we don't go to verse 29 where Paul says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And you know what's interesting about Romans 8, 28? He's writing to people who were suffering and he's writing to them about suffering. And he's saying to them, you don't have to throw in the towel when you suffer because you know what? Your suffering and all the chaos is not gonna throw God's plan off Because he foreknew this, he sovereignly orchestrated it. And so Peter comes to this place right here and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, I'm addressing those of you that have been selected by God. You know what it is that pushes back against this the most in our lives? Let's just be honest. It's pride. We want to believe that we had something to do with this. We, we want to believe that we had something to do with this that puts us in a category different from people who don't accept Christ. We want to hold on to that. But do you understand the doctrine of election as it is outlined in Scripture flattens pride. It obliterates it. It it removes it. There is nothing that I did to bring myself to this. God did this because it's by his grace. It's unmerited. It's not because I mustered up the belief and I mustered up the faith and somebody else didn't muster up the faith and didn't muster up the belief. It is by the sovereign act of God. That is an act of grace. And you say, well, is that grace if he chooses some and doesn't choose others? Could I submit to you that I can't imagine in the world anything more gracious than that he chose me? Can you? Is there any manifestation of grace in your life, the grace of God, than that he selected you, he foreknew you? You didn't bring anything to the table. 
Remember why Peter's doing this. Writing to people that are going to need something to hold on to. It's going to enable them to fish every day and feed themselves every day. He's going to be able to make them stand strong. And beloved, it is not going to be on their own ability to muster up enough belief, confidence, staying power to do. It is only going to be because they understand and know they have been selected by God. Not only selected by God, but set apart in the spirit. We won't spend as much time with these other two because they flow out of that one. Notice he says, in the sanctification of the spirit. Let me just point out to you that this is not talking about sanctification from that practical, progressive journey of you growing in Christ, me growing in Christ, us becoming more holy. Yes, the Holy Spirit is the one that does that, but in context here, Peter is speaking about the sanctifying work that the Holy Spirit does in Christ Jesus by setting apart those who have been elected, those who have been foreknown by God. And this is the realm, and He's going to talk in chapter 2 about us being a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, things that give us a new identity. The Holy Spirit is the one that is setting us apart, putting us in a new family, in a new country, with a new identity. This is the work of the Spirit in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are selected by God. We are set apart in the Spirit, and then we are sealed for obedience to Christ. Don't mention this. You can't ignore the Trinity here, God the Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all are at work, were at work in your salvation and mine. And so notice here, this is where he seems to speak of the purpose God was doing this. He says, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. Now, these two go together. Don't separate them out. First thing that comes to our mind is the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin. We sang about it a moment ago, and that's a very important part of our salvation, obviously, the forgiveness of our sins. But in context, that doesn't seem to be what Peter's referring to here. When he puts obedience or the sprinkling of the blood together, he seems to be referring back to Exodus 24 where the only time we have recorded in Scripture that blood was sprinkled on people. You know, on the Day of Atonement, blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. It's a reflection of, uh, of God's forgiveness of sin. But there's only one time in the Bible that, that, that blood was sprinkled on a group of people, and it's Exodus 24. What's happening there? Well, the Bible says that Moses reads the law to the people. He reads God's commandments, and he calls them to, guess what? obey and the people respond and you know what they respond with we will obey and then you know what Moses does he sprinkles the blood on the tabernacle and on the book and he sprinkles the blood then on the congregation on the people why because it was a symbol of sealing a covenant the people were in covenant relationship with God and it was being sealed by blood. What was this covenant? God extends his grace through his word. He gives the people instructions and the people respond in obedience. You know what Peter's doing here? He's going back to that. He's saying this is what you were saved for. This is what you were saved to. Obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you are in a covenant relationship brought about by the blood of Christ, by the blood of Christ that now brings these things together. And that is your responsibility and ability to obey in Christ Jesus by the work of the Spirit and God's commitment to forgive when you don't. Now, some of you are latching on to what I just said there and you're saying, oh, so you see, you know, I, I can. I can be a Christian, pray a prayer, and, and, and walk an aisle and get my name on the church roll, be baptized, and then live like I want to. No, in fact, that's just the opposite of what this is saying. If this is the work of God in Christ Jesus, and he's entered into a covenant, this is the end to which it leads. 
not a people that begin to fall apart when things are going, not a people that put down stakes in this world, but a people in the midst of this sojourning, traveling through, who have been set apart as a holy priesthood, a new nation, citizens of another country. People like that are a people now in Christ Jesus are in covenant with God, the end of which is obedient lives. That's what characterizes. This is why, beloved, this is why the, the, Bible doesn't, the Bible doesn't entertain the idea of a disobedient Christian. You say, does that mean we're perfect, we never sin? No, that's the covenant. Our lives take on a new character. They take on a new, they take on a new bent. They make it on a new direction. And that is our lives are lived in obedience to Jesus Christ. But as long as we're sojourners living in this body, we're going to mess up from time to time. And when we do, guess what? The forgiveness of God in this covenant is there. It is there. God doesn't write us off. We're not toast and cast aside. We are in covenant relationship with him. So Peter writes to these people and he says, you, you're sealed. You're sealed for obedience to Christ. Beloved, these are the things that are going to enable you to stand strong in the midst of persecution. Not to, to cower, not to give in, not to throw in the towel, but to do what he says over there in chapter 5 when he says, stand firm in it. This is the grace of God, he says there in chapter 5. This whole thing, everything I've said here, it is the grace of God and you are sealed in covenant relationship with him. The last thing is the greeting. Comment on it briefly. I think Peter's praying for provision that is sought by Jesus and that is provision for this to be a practical reality. Grace is is the thing that brings us into the Christian life. It's also the resource that we need to live the Christian life. Peace is the result of it. It's the ability that we have, the blessing we have in the midst of chaos to be at peace, to have joy. We won't always be happy, but we can always be joyful because of this existential shalom that comes only from the cross of Christ. And you see what Peter's doing. He's praying a prayer. May this be multiplied to you. May you just experience it more and more and more in double portion, he's saying. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. This is the way, this is the way he addresses these people. And this is the way the Spirit of God addresses us. People already living in some element of persecution, but people who are facing it becoming worse and worse and worse. What we need in the midst of that is not somebody to give us a practical fix that feeds us for a day. What we need is a worldview, a mindset, a doctrinal foundation that feeds us for a lifetime, even when the lifetime is characterized by persecution and suffering. Peter wants his listeners to remember something. And that's a great, great, segue connection for us to conclude our service before we sing by coming to the Lord's table because the elements of communion are intended for our remembrance, aren't they? Because our Lord knew we would have a tendency to forget. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I want you to take those elements. While they're doing that, if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ, I want you to participate in this, but not in the same way. I don't want you to take these elements like Christians are because these elements are given to believers, but I, I want to invite you to let your participation be to process what these elements represent. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, know that we're about to take some elements that remind us that Jesus died for you, he died for me, that he shed his blood so your sins could be forgiven. And so if you're here without Christ today, I just want to invite you right there, whether it be in this room or watching online, wherever you are, turn your heart to God. I plead with you to do that. Acknowledge to him in your own words that you're a sinner and you're separated from him. And acknowledge that Jesus did something about your sin when he died on the cross for it. He took your place and he's the only one that could do that. And in your own words... Just turn your heart to God in repentance and faith. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I plead with you to do that. Believers in Christ, let's revisit what Jesus has done for us. 
that has brought about the forgiveness of our sins. But remember, by the sprinkling of that blood in this sealing of the covenant has provided everything that we need for ongoing forgiveness as well as the sustenance to endure until he comes back. So as you're ready as a believer in Christ, you feel free to peel off that first layer and take that bread and, and take it, remembering that Jesus said, this is my body. And as you're ready, if you would, peel back the second layer. And remember our Lord's words. This is the blood of my covenant that was given to you for the remission of sins. Lord, we do this in remembrance today. Remembrance of what you and you alone have done for us. And we want to say thank you. We rejoice in your great salvation and the forgiveness that you've given to us through your sacrifice. Thank you, Lord. We love you. Don't ever let us forget. And Lord, we pray that you would give us grace to embrace and to remember that you're the one that has called us to this by your choosing, not by ours. You have shown us great grace and mercy. And in doing that, you've provided everything we knew, need to endure until you come back for us. And we look forward to that. We long for it. We anticipate it. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Let's stand together and let's worship the Lord through song before we go.
we can say that with all assurance today. Praise the one who set us free. Thank you, Dr. Shaddix. A beautiful message this morning. Well, aren't you glad that we have Dr. Shaddix here? I know I don't say that enough, but can we just thank him once again for being here with us? We're grateful for the time that you've been with us. Amen. Church, thanks for being with us again today. We look forward to having you back next Sunday as we worship together and pray that you have a great week in the Lord. Uh, we leave today with the benediction that we always do, a blessing from Psalm 67 that says, May God be gracious to you and bless you. May he make his face shine upon you so that his may, may be known on the earth and his salvation among all the nations. Church, we love you. Go in peace. Have a great week.